short nap to restore my energy before he came over. We used to see each other once a week on a Wednesday night down at the club. You see, Wednesday night was training night. And in the beginning, we were the ones training under the watchful gaze of the old guard. We'd run a few laps, kick the ball around a bit. Nothing too serious, but. And then it was back to the clubhouse for a few drinks. Now the drinking, that was serious. But as we got older, the first became the seconds, and then, then we became the old guard. Funny, because by then, it was the football that was serious, not the drinking. That our game would have been better had we done it the other way around. We always said we'd get back on the field when we lost a bit of weight and the kids got on and worked quiet and down. <laughs> it never happened. But we always kept Wednesday nights free, just in case. Rosie didn't know not to tell him, but I didn't want anyone to know. So I never could lie to him, he'd see right through it. But I could bend the truth a little and withhold a few key details. <laughs> so I wasn't ready to tell him. I wasn't ready to tell anyone, really. Anyway, I knew I'd pay for it, and I did. That night, Rosie tells him everything. Well, if not everything, then enough. Enough that he doesn't go anywhere that night. It was a rotten thing to do, leaving it to Rosie. Anyone to make a fuss, so I tried to keep it a secret. I knew it would get out, of course, and it did. But I wasn't ready to tell anyone, because telling someone meant you had to say it, and saying it was, well, somehow different to thinking it. And I had been thinking it for a long time. I, I just couldn't say it. it you, you, you're right, I was in denial. And I figured Ian had something to do with it getting out. Yeah, he had to be involved, so I blamed him. And the next time I saw him, I told him to piss off for telling everyone down at the club. But you know... Deep down, I was glad that it was out. Relief that I didn't have to tell everyone. And happy too. Because they slowly came trickling around to see me. Because by then, I was pretty much housebound. <laughs> it was good to catch up with them all. Some even came on a Wednesday. Oh, later, I found out it was Simon. He saw me as I was coming out of radio at Peter Mack one afternoon. Pity I told him to piss off like that. I I missed seeing him on a Wednesday night. I looked forward to it. But I wasn't going to back down, and, and I didn't think he would either, but one day he shows up out of the blue for Rosie's birthday. A few beers under one arm and a bottle of champagne under the other. For the girls, he says. It was Wednesday, and you couldn't have Wednesday night training without a beer with Ian. I didn't have the heart to tell him I couldn't stand the stuff anymore. Ugh, too bitter. Doc says that's common with chemo. So I took a polite sip, I had to really, but that's about all I could stand. And then Ian, he looks down at my glass and notices it's still full. And with a perfectly straight face, he says, Sorry, mate, looks like a bad bottle. I'll get you another one from the kitchen. And he comes back with bubbly. In a beer glass. I never used to like the stuff, but I did then. <laughs> Chemo, <laughs> what could you say? From that day on, Ian always brought a bottle of champers to Wednesday night training. And we drank it together, in beer glasses. My bed was near the front door. And early on, everyone used the front door when they came to visit. They'd poke their head in and say hi, maybe have a chat. But one by one, they stopped coming in that way. They didn't think I'd notice, but I did. They avoided the front door and started coming in through the kitchen door. Just in case I was asleep, they'd say. People changed doors when they couldn't pretend anymore. When they could no longer pretend that it was a misdiagnosis. Or admit even to themselves that it was going to kill me. That's when people started coming in through the kitchen door. Easier to pretend things were normal that way. Like I'd just stepped out for a moment. Far easier than thinking of me laying here. Yeah, well, by the end, pretty much everyone came in through the kitchen, except Ian. Oh, and those who didn't know, you know, I felt sorry for them. The doorbell startled me. It never rang on a Friday, only ever rang on a Wednesday. And Barb was there, the palliative care nurse. 
I think the doorbell startled her more than it did me. <laughs> I won't believe it. When I rang the bell, it was Barb who answered. I mean, it's not uncommon for us to work with the same family. She keeps the patients comfortable while they're still alive, and I keep the families comfortable when they've died. But I was not prepared for this. I didn't know she was working with Bill. Oh, hello, Ian, she says. But Ian, he always comes in through the front door, says hi to me first. Tells me I look like crap and have a terminal case of bed hair or some shit like that. And, <laughs> you know, I quite like the idea of dying from terminal bed hair. <laughs> Something terribly decadent about that. <laughs> you see, he was never afraid to talk to me. To tell me that he was dead tired at the end of a long day. Or to talk about the holiday he was planning, knowing very well I wouldn't be around to see the photos. <laughs> yeah, it must be to do with his job. Yeah, he's comfortable with death. I was uncomfortable. It left me speechless for a moment, Barb being there. An uncomfortable collision between the sombre professional and the mate of, what, 30 years. <coughs> Eventually I sputtered out, I'm, I, I'm here for Bill. Barb goes to answer the door and I try to call out to her, let Ian in, but my throat was dry and my voice weak and she didn't hear me. Oh, there seems to be some sort of mistake, she says. You're early. We'll give you a call. In a couple of days, when he's ready. <laughs> I, I just stood there in stunned silence. She was trying to turn me away. All I wanted to do was say my goodbyes like everyone else. She tried to turn him away, poor bastard. But always the consummate professional. You know, you could strap him down and make him listen to Oh Danny Boy, Ave Maria, Wind Beneath My Wings, <laughs> one after the other, on continuous loop playback, and he wouldn't even get a lump in his throat. Oh, I know. Oh, I did it to him once. <laughs> and I'll be damned if there wasn't a quiver in his voice by the time Barb let him in. I don't know which of them felt worse. So there we sat, the two of us. He had something on his mind. I don't mean that he was worried about his death. He'd been resigned to that for some time. No, I just expected him to want me to look after Maggie and the kids. We just sat there in silence. Seemed like forever. But I know how to break an uncomfortable silence between the two of us. Our standard code for, come on out with it. So, didn't the French get a thrashing in Asian court? <laughs> it worked. <laughs> By the time we both stopped laughing, the response was classic Bill, direct and to the point, just like in the old days. Well, I figure if anyone's going to sew a cork up my ass, it better be you. <laughs> Took a moment for it to sink in. What I was asking of him. On the one hand, a chance to help him across the divide. But it came at a price. The chance to grieve openly with everyone else. For the first time in 30 years that he didn't have a quick comeback. You know, it's um, your fault, really, that we're here together today. And as for Plugging you up so that you don't leak? Well, today is Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, Wednesday night training just will not be the same <coughs> without you. And after all, you did ask. <laughs>